welcome on. Hey, Would hey. you like to introduce oh, yourself? Yeah. Thank you for having me. Uh, hi, yeah, my name is Corbinian, and I'm a quantum scientist working on Penny Lane at uh, Xanadu. Thank you for having cool. me. Cool, cool. So can you tell us a little bit about what Penny Lane is? What is Penny Lane? Uh, Penny Lane is many things. Um, it's, a, it's a Python package that is completely open source, uh, which, oh, I have a little guest here that was not sketched. Um, <laughs> It's a, it's a Python package um, for simulating and running quantum computers. And uh, the big feature of Penny Lane, it is um, automatically differentiable, whether you're on quantum hardware or in, in simulation. And um, sorry about that. It's a quantum cat. It's a quantum <laughs> cat. Um, I've, I've actually got one of those right, right over here as well. <laughs> well, now we know that it yeah. is alive. Because we yeah. it, it is alive. It is very alive. Okay. Gotcha. Um, yeah, and like so, basically, if you are if you are a researcher um, trying to play with quantum algorithms, uh, Penny Lane is your go-to place. It is very easy to quickly prototype uh, new algorithms. It's very easy to to check things numerically, figure things out. Um, that yeah, Penny Lane is your go-to place for for these kind of things. Cool. So um, our launch today, I guess I'll just situate it a little bit further in relation to uh, my service Bracket. So uh, Bracket is a, an AWS service that gives you access to multiple different types of quantum computers. And one of those is uh, the Quera device, which is this neutral atom Rydberg array that I was just describing. And then I was giving a little bit of background on what pulse programming is. So can you tell us, uh, Corbinian, what is it specifically that, that, we've, that we've launched recently? Okay, uh, yeah, sure. Um, so the, the Aquila device that we now have access to, so in principle, um, Penny Lane is hardware agnostic. That means anything, anything you're, you're programming there for simulation, you should be able to in principle run also on an actual quantum computer. And uh, now we have access to one of these quantum computers directly through Penny Lane, through the bracket plugin. And we can, yeah, we can, we can access that quantum computer now and we can run the programs in simulation on a small scale, we can now scale them up and run them on a real quantum computer. In that case, with uh, 200, 250 atoms that we have access to. Very cool. So I am curious, can you talk to us a little bit about how the construction of these of these pulse level controls like works between penny lane and bracket and query kind of there's there's a lot of moving parts so can you can you talk us through how that how that kind of flows yeah sure so um typically as you were as you were explaining already um, um earlier when 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 you think of quantum computing it's kind of this assembly level language where we talk about circuits um which are which are composed of uh, of native gates um, and you, you send those instructions to your quantum computer that is typically on, on cloud, like nobody has a quantum computer at their home. And yeah, that there's some, some level of translation of, your, of that circuit into something the machine can run, some, some electromagnetic pulses and waves. And now what, we're, what we've added is the functionality to operate on that lower level. So like we go from basically the assembly, we go to really like the, the machine level, the machine level instructions of send electromagnetic wave with this frequency and with this amplitude for this amount of time. And uh, yeah, if you will, this is like the, the lower level and there are um, certain use cases for that. For example, maybe for the particular circuit or the algorithm that you have in mind that you want to be running, maybe it is smarter to find an optimized pulse sequence that runs exactly that algorithm maybe in a shorter time than if you were just like um, without thinking about it, sending the instructions of these predefined pulses that the hardware vendor will typically do for you. Mm -hmm. So it gives you more access, more control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah. because uh, a lot of if you a lot of the introductions to quantum computing, you see all of the gate logic and a lot of like the most simple algorithms. Uh, you're working with gates, so I can see how pulse. Uh, Pulse level domain stuff can, can you, like you said, give you more control. Is that right? Yeah, ex exactly. That is that is that is the whole point at this point. Uh, it gives you, it, it gives you more control. Um, I must say there is so to step one step back. There are um, universal quantum computers, and 
we know that universal quantum computers can do things that classical computers don't. Sure. And one of these one of these uh, applications that people typically are interested in is quantum simulation. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to simulate a quantum system with a quantum computer. For example, you have electrons in a battery floating about, and you're wondering how do these electrons behave? And what you, instead of building the battery and like doing the experiment and, and measuring it, you're trying to simulate the behavior of the electrons on a quantum computer. The reason why you want to do that on a quantum computer is because um, this behavior is quantum mechanical and a classical computer turns out to be very bad at simulating quantum behavior. And that is why you want to do it natively on a quantum computer. This whole field is called quantum simulation. And the device we're talking about today, this QR device, is a special purpose quantum simulator. Cool. So I think we actually, we've got a couple of questions in the chat uh, that I want to try and hit before we keep going with this with this demo. Um, can you Can we bring those up, or the first one at least? Uh, so we have this question um, from Kieran Pai. What are the practical applications for quantum computing? So great question. Um, currently, the stage that we're in in quantum mechanics, well, quantum mechanics, the stage we're in in quantum mechanics, I, hopefully it stays the same. Um, the stage we're in quantum computing is called NISC, which is noisy intermediate scale quantum. And so what we mean by this is uh, there are some limitations in what devices are able to achieve in the current state of the hardware. So we kind of have these long-term visions and these long-term goals of running false tolerant algorithms. And a lot of the things that you hear about in the news about quantum computing are algorithms that will ultimately run on fault tolerant quantum computers. So if you've ever heard like quantum computers are going to break encryption, you need a much bigger, much higher quality, um, much higher fidelity quantum computer than we are anywhere near right now uh, in order to run that. So um, practical applications, long term, yeah, uh, we've got we've got I mean, Corbidian mentioned one like battery chemistry, you know, simulating new materials. So uh, yeah, actually, this this one where you talk about simulating quantum mechanics, there are so many opportunities where you know that seems like it's a really niche use case, but actually it applies across a ton of different domains. Um, yeah, did you want to talk a little bit more about that? Maybe we're Corbinian. Uh, yeah, sh sure. Um, that, yeah, I think uh, one, at least for me personally, the, 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 one of the killer applications of quantum computing is going to be quantum simulation, simulating complex uh, quantum systems, which is super relevant for a huge part of, um, of industry and society. Um, material science, uh, chemistry, like, I think if you, if you really manage to, to get a quantum computer running and be able to run these simulations on a large scale with, uh, with high fidelity, you already have a a huge application and use case for your quantum computers, for sure. Yep. Yeah, Jordan, I just want to let you know that uh, your flub didn't go over. Uh, I, I didn't miss it. I, of course, don't want the state of quantum me mechanics to change. So that was fun. Yeah, I, I know. That'd be scary, right? <laughs> I got I got the joke. It was fun. <laughs> um, all right. So I like. I think we have another question here um, from Tom Zanadu. Uh, what would you find most useful to learn about in quantum computing? Uh, this is a very tough question. I don't know. It depends on what you're interested in. I mean, like, that's kind of one of the fun things I find about quantum computing, that there are so many different ways to approach it. Like, there are people, for instance, like, I, I used to do quantum error correction research. And so even within that really small niche, there are people with a background in, like, classical error correction, people who, who work on, you know, error correction for, you know, Intel for like really tiny transistors. There are people who work in the theory of error correction from uh, the classical like information theory perspective. There are people who come at it from a complete com quant uh, uh, classical complexity theory background in theoretical computer science. There are people who come at it from a pure math like topological standpoint. Um, and I'm sure I'm I'm, I'm a giving everybody a little bit of a hard time with it with the ASL of finger spelling here. So sorry, I'm, I'm using a bunch of kind of crazy words right now. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's so many different ways that you can kind of approach it in so many ways you can learn. I mean, probably the most useful thing is just like learn linear algebra really well. Um, it's kind of that's that's going to help you in a lot of areas. Um, but I don't know, that's my opinion. Do you, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, the, the, the def definitely that area. Um, I, I remember when I when I I, I, stu I studied physics because I wanted to uh, understand quantum mechanics. My my high school course was not enough because 
we we lacked the math and we we couldn't really understand like there was some like weird stuff going on but you couldn't really grasp it uh fast forward 10 years later and i think i still don't fully grasp it but i think i've just gotten so used to the topic that i feel like i, under, I understand it but uh yeah, whenever I talk to my my parents or 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 other family members that are not in this in this field, and they ask very good questions, and you find yourself, oh, really? I I, I never thought about it like that. That that's to me usually the really interesting part because uh, you you really question uh, what am I actually doing and how does uh, quantum mechanics, quantum computing, how how does it actually work? So I, I think it's like an 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 endless opportunity to learn, and you'll never stop learning. That's that's kind of the beauty of it. Totally. Uh, and we actually had uh, another comment. Uh, and after this one, we'll, we'll move on. But um, we had a comment from uh, Abhijit, and he pointed out that this could be useful for molecular simulations, which are important in prescription drug development. So yes, absolutely. This is this is an application area that, that we see as, as potentially fruitful. Um, yeah, so jumping back to the launch, uh, let's talk a little bit more about the the, the Pulse domain. Um, so one question, we've kind of touched on this already, like why is, why is the Pulse level domain interesting? Like why not just stay on the level of gate-based circuits? Doesn't it introduce like some complexity in order to design these Pulse sequences? I mean, you have to optimize them, kind of, how do we think about that? Yeah, actually, uh, optimizing them is uh, quite quite a pain, uh, as we uh, recently learned when we when we try to do these things uh, our, ourselves. It's it's not it's not the most trivial thing. Uh, you're typically searching in a in a huge search space, so um, in a huge parameter space. Um, so it's not it's not the easiest task. And the question is why why would you want to do it? Um, the reason for that is typically because currently the devices that we have access to are somewhat um, limited by noise and if you just apply like if you just translate whatever your circuit is from your algorithm into the predefined pulses and and stack them one after the other um you 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 quickly run out of of, of coherence time essentially or of of accumulating errors so you wanna you wanna really make the most out of the hardware that you currently have access to and that's why you typically want to optimize specifically for your hardware specifically for um, the algorithm that, that you're using. Yeah. Um, so we got another question, which is actually relevant to what I was going to say next, um, which is what's the, the max amount of accumulated qubits at present uh, from Frank L looks like. And uh, so on the device we're actually going to be talking about today, it's it's 256, I think, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, something like that. Um, yeah, so, but not, but not all qubits are the same or equal, right? Because yeah. these are different type of qubits. Yep. Exactly, exactly. So there is a difference between, as Corbini was saying earlier, like universal quantum computers, universal gate-based quantum computers, and other ones that kind of have different special properties. So the, the particular device we're talking about is an analog Hamiltonian simulation device. And if you're not familiar with any of those terms, it's fine. Um, basically, what it means is that instead of taking each individual qubit, quantum bit, um, as a kind of an abstract I idea. We, we use the the control of the overall system kind of as one, and we, we evolve that system in time. Well, hopefully we've started by encoding our problem into the system, and then we let the system kind of evolve over time and basically use the physical, like analog, um, actual evolution of the quantum system in order to find the solution to our problem. So when we say we have 256 qubits, in this case, they are analog Hamiltonian simulation style qubits. Cool, that's interesting. So let's talk about how we interact with the AWS service Brocket. So it seems like we're talking about a release of a plugin for Pennywise that allows you to- Penny Lane, <laughs> not Pennywise. Yeah. Oh, Pennywise, Penny Lane, I'm so sorry. I'll be frightened. Yeah, <laughs> they all float. Um, so uh, the plugin for Penny Lane to utilize Bracket and thus utilize the QR machine that Jordan was just talking about. Can we can we give some details on how that works? Yeah, sure. Um, actually, there is not too much to it. Um, in the sense, from the user perspective, you're simply writing your like 
you're writing your quantum algorithm, your, your pulse program, as you would usually do in Penny Lane. And you can then choose whether you want to run that on simulation or you would want to run that on the um, bracket, like on the, the QERA hardware through bracket. There is like a package that you need to install a, a little plugin that kind of activates this connection. But from a user perspective, it's 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 pretty seamless. Um, of course, you you want to make sure that uh, what you're what you're sending to device makes sense. So you you, you might want to. Um, do your due diligence and, and check uh, check the programs that you're sending, because um, if it's not really a fit, it will raise an error. But um, yeah, uh, from a user perspective, pretty seamless. Can we see it in action? Oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, you wanna you wanna see it right yeah, now? Yeah. Let's bring up our demo. Cool. Uh, yeah. So I have this little little demo here, and there's there's three parts. Um, in the first part, you really only need Penny Lane installed. So you do pip install Penny Lane. That is it. For the second part, uh, you need to have Amazon Bracket a plugin um, installed. This is just another pip install Amazon Bracket Penny Lane plugin, as, as noted here. And I'm sure my uh, colleagues in the chat um, will, will put the relevant links. And then in the last part, um, we, we send it we send it to the to the real device. And for that, you need to have your AWS account set up. Now, in the beginning, um, the idea is that uh, you, I think, I'm not sure if we actually have talked about this yet, but um, with these, with this device that we have access to here, you can place the atoms really in arbitrary positions in space. So you can literally put an atom at one position and another atom at another position precisely where you want them to be. And as a user, I can just define, I, I say here, coordinates, um, I'm doing a linear chain and it looks something looks something like this. I adjust the linear um, chain. In that case, I'm only doing uh, nine atoms for demonstrational purposes. And yeah, they're arranged in this linear chain uh, and they're interacting with each other. So this is my first step of setting up the, the device. Um, and really quick, Corbidian, I'm not gonna uh, pretend like I knew this before doing research, but the QR machine, it's holding the atoms uh, in place with lasers. And what Corvinian was just talking about, arranging them in certain places, is very similar to field programmable uh, CPUs, where you can kind of change the architecture. In this case, you're changing the actual location of the atoms. I, did I get that right, Corvinian? Uh, exactly, 100%. Yeah. Uh, that's exactly it. And this is quite an amazing technical achievement already to be able to do that. Um, there are some funny demonstrations where people really do like arbitrary shapes. I don't know, they're drawing the Eiffel Tower or um, <laughs> writing out a name of somebody. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can get creative with this. Uh, I'm, I, I haven't been that creative for my demo and I just have that linear chain for, for physical purposes. Uh, now I have, I have these atoms um, in, in these positions and they're, they're fixed now from, from move, moving on. And what I can do now, I can shine a laser on these atoms. And, for that laser, I can control the detuning of the laser and the amplitude of the laser. What, what do I mean with the detuning? So the laser light has a certain frequency and whether that frequency matches the transition frequency of the atoms that I'm, that I'm shining my laser light onto, the difference between those two, that is my detuning. So if my detuning is zero, that means the frequency of my laser light that I'm shining onto my atoms is exactly resonant with the transition of these atoms. And when I'm talking about atoms, I'm, I'm really meaning uh, two particular levels of the electrons of that atom. The other um, quantity that I have access to is the amplitude of that laser. So you can think of it like how, how, um, how strong is the intensity of, of, of my laser. And those two are the parameters that I have access to and that I can alter. And this is the way I'm performing a quantum simulation. And uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by just preparing my atoms in, in these positions and I'm putting them into their ground state. And I know that this uh, ground set of each of these atoms corresponds to a, a larger ground set of the whole of a, of a Hamiltonian of the system. And what I can do, I can, I can alter these quantities, the, the frequency and the amplitude of the laser to move my ground state around in, in some abstract phase space and I can, I can go across a quantum phase transition and I can reach a different phase 
where the atoms are um, yeah, in, in, a, in a different different state of matter. And uh, yeah, like uh, that's exactly what I'm what I'm what I'm doing in this demo. Uh, let me show you a little plot. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm just setting these quantities the way I want to change them. I'm, I'm taking a walk through parameter space, and how this looks in the end. Um, this was just really quick. Uh, what's the problem that we're trying to solve here by by doing this? Mm. Uh, what's the problem that we're trying to solve is we're okay. trying to prepare an interesting, an interesting state of matter. We, we're, mm -hmm. we're trying to perform quantum simulation by preparing an interesting state of matter. And we're doing that by walking through parameter space into a different phase of matter. That, does that make a little bit of sense? It, it it does to me. I'm not. I uh, I should check with Jeff uh, if if it makes sense it, to the non. You know that is. A, it's a little bit over my head. I'm I'm not going to lie. I understand the okay. quantum simulation, but it sounds like you're just doing a simple quantum simulation. It is. It is. It is kind of a toy a toy example yeah. of a, of a quantum simulation in in yeah. a way. Um, may, maybe this helps. So on this plot here on the left hand side, you see on the on the vertical lines you see the excitation of each of the atoms. So we have nine atoms, and for each of them, we plot by a color the excitation of, that, um, of each of those atoms. And in the beginning, we're in a kind of boring state where all there's no excitation, basically. And what we're doing now, we're turning on our laser, we're increasing the amplitude, and at the same time, we're changing the detuning of our laser. And we're moving in phase space to another point where the ground state is a little more interesting. And as you can see from the, on the horizontal axis where we have our pulse, so this is just the time where my laser is on, I see the, the state of matter changing over time. So I'm going from this kind of boring state where everything is in the ground state to a pattern emerging. So we now have this pattern of um, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. And this is an antiferromagnet. So this is a different phase of matter somewhere in between. We crossed, we crossed a quantum phase transition and we've performed our quantum simulation. Now, maybe this is a bit confusing because I'm using the word simulation in two different ways. What I'm showing you here is actually simulation. So this is like run on my laptop. The whole computation is done on my laptop. Now, what I would typically do is I would first do that simulation on my laptop and then I go and I try to run that on the real device. Mm -hmm. Now, currently, that real device is not online, um, but what we can do is we can run it on a simulator first. So that simulator is, again, simulation, but slightly different. It takes into account, for example, the finite shots of the device. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit more realistic simulation of the system. And we can run the same pull sequence. Um, you can see now the program is running. Um, it's doing it's doing this evolution, the same yeah this, the same change of parameters, and I looking at the the final result of that simulation. So with um, this cell, where we're actually running on the Aquila device. No, um, so ideally we would be right now, but the device is not online right now. So currently this is actually on um, a simulator that is closer to the real device. So there are three stages. There's the penny lane simulation. There's the Aquila simulator, and then the, the Aquila device itself. And we're currently at the second stage where we're running it um, in the Aquila simulator. And then there's the, now, the actual the, the stage of the system that we're, we're trying to do the analog Hamiltonian simulation of the system. There's like three levels of simulation here. Exactly. Yeah, that's a, it's, the, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a bit yeah, complicated, the terminology, uh, what, what is meant with simulation and when. So as we see here, we, we get our final state, uh, similarly to, to, the pic to the picture above. There are some uh, small defects here where we still see some excitation, but overall we get the qualitative picture that we would expect. Now, as I said, the device is currently not online, but I've, I've run this experiment before. And what we can do is we can retrieve the actual data from the device that, that I've run in the past. So I, I, I go on my AWS dashboard, I check the, the, the job ID, uh, that I've been using for this, and I can retrieve that data again. And we can look at it again, and uh, we see that the data looks uh, very similar. The discrepancies are a bit bigger because now we actually have real noise in the device, and there's, of course, finite size effects. We only have uh, nine atoms here. 
Um, but yeah, overall, qualitatively, we really see that the different phase of matter, which is in this case an antiferromagnetic phase. Um, now, this all, like I'm doing that for nine atoms, and there's no point of using a quantum computer for nine atoms. You don't, you don't really have to do that. However, um, once you go, once you scale that up, and you can easily scale that up with that device, um, you can you can reach, for example, uh, I have here results for 50 atoms. It's a grid of um, two, uh, 10 by 10 by five, and that I, I wouldn't go as far as saying it's impossible to simulate on my laptop, but it would be a much bigger effort, um, both in terms of the compute resource and then also being clever about the simulation itself. So. Um, Running that on my laptop is really non-trivial and, and, and really difficult, but on that device, I can just basically run the same pulse, pulse sequence, but scaled up to a much larger system. And we can, again, look at, at the results. We see here a, a nice checkerboard pattern that we would kind of, kind of expect. We see some def defects here and there. They are due to noise and due to, um, due to boundary effects. But overall, we get the qualitative uh, picture that we would they would expect from from that quantum simulation. Yeah. So with the ferromagnet in like a line, we have the spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down state, right? Um, with all those items. So with this one, what we're seeing is that essentially you have the up and down all, but in a checkerboard pattern since it's in two D, right? Exactly, exactly. And that is because I've arranged my atoms in a checkerboard um, array. Now, the interesting, the, I think that the, the part of that the device becomes more interesting is when, when, when you start changing those configurations and you, you, you start using um, a different, different patterns and other phases of matter emerge. Very cool. So we actually, we got a comment from someone asking, uh, can we, is there, is there an open source project with a readme file, uh, on GitHub that we can get involved? So, um, yeah, that's uh, Pennyland is open source. So yeah, please, uh, I think we'll share those links all in the chat. So, uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, yeah. Was there anything else you kind of wanted to share in your demo or any other closing thoughts? Corvidian? Yeah. So like, so, so generally like for, especially for that, that user comment just now, um, so this is all currently in development and I, we really do appreciate feedback and I think it's, 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 it's nice for us receiving feedback, but it's also nice for users because we typically interact with the, with the feedback. And if you, for example, say, Hey, this would be cool if we had this and that feature, it, it, it's not unlikely that that feature will, will actually make it to product. Um, so it's, it's worth it, uh, interacting and we, we do appreciate it, um, getting, getting that feedback, uh, on GitHub. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is that, so th this kind of experiment here, like this experiment that I, that I, that I'm showing you this, this plot alone, like a few years ago, this, this, this would have been a big paper, um, run by many people in an experimental lab having being like a huge effort, probably on the time scales of a year, if not even more. And now I have the ability to run that through the cloud from my laptop, um, that, that same experiment. And I think the it's it's really not clear at this point what these machines will be really useful for but the fact that we have really this possibility of arbitrarily placing these atoms somewhere in space i'm sure there must be an interesting use case and part of the point of this whole project is to enable people to to play with that like really like to play with it play around with it um and that yeah that's the that's the main purpose the main goal i would say well, that goes back to what me and Jordan were talking about earlier is about democratizing the technology and getting it into as many hands as possible. And it sounds like this plugin uh, is doing just that uh, using Brocket. So that's that's great. Yeah, I mean, just to reiterate this, literally, you can control atoms with lasers. You don't even need to do anything, but like you don't need a special type of account. Like you can just sign up for AWS and be like, I want to, I want to make a quantum spin liquid on this device uh, with, with, you know, Rydberg atoms and, and control it with laser pulses. Like you could just do that. It's, 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 I don't know. It's, it's kind of mind blowing to me. I, I used to also work in an experimental lab. So it's, it's very cool that this is, this is so integrated now that it is. Well, Jordan, you're kind of, you're kind of joking, but it's, it's literally things like that, that get people involved, that it, it might sound silly to someone at first, but then they do it and they, that's where the, the, it, everything starts to snowball. So. Yeah. I and I mean, like we're, we're in such an interesting time for quantum computing, you know, it's, it's still very early days and uh, it, 
it's always fun for me to read kind of history of classical computing and kind of the the experiments people were doing then, like they didn't know how any of this was going to turn out. They were doing the best they could. They were programming <laughs> on the level of, of Boolean logic circuits and like then, you know, eventually using vacuum tubes and like, you know, the technology evolves. And uh, it's it's so fun to to just play around with what you can do now and, and try to uh, theorize about what's going to be possible later as well. So, yeah. Yeah, well, Corbinian, uh, thank you so much for, for joining. And, and I mean, I've learned a ton and I appreciate, uh, I appreciate your time and effort and doing some of these cool uh, experiments for us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, it's, been, it's been great fun. For sure.